Welcome to On Tapes Podcast, a podcast about the physical medium of VHS tapes. My name is Rowan, and each time we record, my co-host Mark and I look at three tapes. One film which I have chosen, one film which he has chosen, and a third multi tape which we pick at random. What do we have to talk about this episode, Mark? Today, Rowan, we have Jackie, uh, Jackie Brown. Jackie! <laughs> Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. We have Francois Truffaut's adaptation of Ray Bradbury's novel Fahrenheit 451. And we have NFL compilation tape. The best of like the end 1989 season, apparently. Something belly laughs, something. I like that you noted that one of these films is an adaptation of a novel, but not the other one. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd say because Jackie Brown feels more like Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown, and Fahrenheit 451 still feels like Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Fair enough. Where would you like to begin? Uh, Jackie Brown. We like that. Take it away. Why did you pick Jackie Brown? You picked Jackie Brown. I did pick Jackie Brown. I, I acquired this tape through a bundle I bought online. Various tapes. Uh, this just happened to be one of them. It was a film I knew I liked. So I was like, ah, I could get it on a new format. And then we started a podcast. And I picked it for the podcast. Yeah. Because I just wanted to watch a film I thought was kind of good. Well, in your words, uh, we both like Jackie Brown, but we haven't seen it together. Not true. We saw it at the cinema together. Yeah, in hindsight, we did see it in the cinema together. <laughs> This is based on a novel by Elmore Leonard. Yes, it is. Apparently you've read this book recently. Yes, I did, all the way through. A lot of differences between the book and the film. Really? Yeah. You'd think that a Tarantino film would be more violent than the book. No. It's like seven gun shoots. Good shot. Good shootouts. There you There's go. There's like seven shootouts. Who gets shot? Characters we don't meet in the movie? Yeah. A lot of Ordell's boys. Ordell's got boys? Yeah, but, lots. But Ordell's supposed to have girls. No, lots of boys. Well, he's got girls as well. Well, I mean, the book is set in Florida, and ah. Ordell's boys are all Jamaica, and that's where he gets the gets the guns from. He gets the guns from Jamaica instead of Mexico? Yeah. Does he still have the... No, he sells the guns to Jamaica, that's how it works, isn't it? Does he still have the uh, chin monstrosity? I believe so, but he's uh, very... I do like the beard. <laughs> I call it a monstrosity. Uh, it's quite unpleasant, isn't it? It's a good, it's a good character thing, though. A lot people complain about Sam Jackson in the same role every time, but in this one he's got a beard. He's quite different in this one, I think. There's a sort of weird, creepy sleaziness to him that you don't get in a lot of his roles. Yeah. In the book, his character is black, but he's very really pale skinned. So his nickname's Bread for White Bread. <laughs> okay. And uh, Lewis and Odell used to work together like 20 years ago, and Melanie was there. So Melanie has known Lewis before in the book. How old's Melanie meant to be in the book? Like 30 something. Ah. Interesting. Yeah, and also... Jamie... everything, Almost everything you're seeing, I think I pref- would prefer... I mean, not the book, but I think I prefer the way it sounds in the movie. Bridget Fonda, uh, in the film, obviously very skinny. Uh, in the book, known for having a big arse and big breasts. Wild. Yeah, very different, very different. In the book, is Beaumont his first or last name? <laughs> I believe Beaumont is Christian name. <laughs> is Beaumont in the book? Yeah, but he's Jamaican. Oh, he's not um, Chris Chris Tucker. Tucker. No. No. So, before we actually talk about the movie movie, do you want to talk about um, the trailers? Oh, yeah. We have a lot of notes on these trailers. Now available, we have... uh, The best film yet from the director of Sense and Sensibility, Roger Ebert. Apparently Nixon's a liar. Uh, That's what I've learned from the Ice Storm trailer. (laughs) Then we got the Goodwill Hunting trailer, and the trailer for She's So Lovely. She's So Lovely... Uh, that's all boring yeah, uh, very standard that. fare but have you looked at the ads inside this box no good tape noise there um, what do we have in here we've got uh, Guillermo del Toro's mimic what's I the, think what's the quote to go along with that uh, a bold experiment a deadly mistake and the next one <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> Quentin Tarantino presents Curdled starring Billy Baldwin and Angela Jones the quote says from cult director Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Te- is it, though? Technically, they're not lying. And then Nightwatch, starring Ewan McGregor from Trainspotting. <laughs> then Scream 2, which, according to Maxim, is a cool, sexy film. <laughs> Thanks, Maxim. Buy them now on video. Yeah, I found the ones in the inside of the tape much more interesting than the actual ones on tape. They're yeah. clearly part of Buena Vista's thriller series. Yeah, very much so. Uh, was it saying there? £11 something? Ad price, 11 I think I got all these tapes for like 
Don't break the box. I would say it says thrilling classics to add to your collection. Oh, I thought you were going to snap the box there. So when I was watching this, it was very much letterbox in like a little dot inside my screen. And uh, fairly early in the movie... Oh, was it a box all the way around? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it was quite bad. And early on in the movie, there's a scene where it's Ordell and Lewis watching the uh, the gun ad <laughs> on the uh, TV. Nothing but, comes between me and my AK. And I'm going to show you a picture now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if you can imagine this, it's a, my black lines all the way around the edge of the screen. And then the wall in the movie... And then the TV in the movie, so it's like... <laughs> it's like kind the, of weird step-framing kind of thing. Yeah, like a step-framing thing. Frame within a frame, which you like. Uh, that's that's what, that's my notes on the presentation of this film for me. It looked pretty washed out, didn't it? It looked terrible. <laughs> it looked so bad. This is... I, I, when I think of Jackie Brown, I think of, like, nice, vibrant, bright LA colours, like... Um, Ordell's fashion sense is quite yeah. bright. Same with Jackie... Big yellow coat, her blue uniform. Yeah, hey, uh, his um, lime green bomber jacket. Yeah, Max Cherry has some good outfits. Not colourful, but Not colourful. everyone has good outfits, honestly. Lewis has some of the best outfits. Does he? Yeah. When he's, when he's looking like a bomb, they're like, you're really looking like a bomb. And he's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just this is going to be the most incoherent review of this film ever, by the way. Yeah, I feel like we both know too much about it. We both know this film very well, so uh, don't expect us to go about this as simply this is just us gushing over a movie we like you know in the film a box she's called Jackie Burke no she's not she is I assume Quentin changed the name to create some kind of continuity with Pam Greer's black exploitation films like Foxy Brown yeah I once had a nurse called Jackie Brown uh-huh. that was her name and I was like oh wow is that Pam Greer it's like, it wasn't Pam Greer I found a lot of Lewis lines quite good this is uh, Robert De Niro's best character it's top five I'll gear that. It's a strange one for him, isn't it? It's very subdued until it's not. Yeah. I always... But he is a psychopath. We learned that by the end. He's a, he's a nutter. But he's quite like reserved to begin with. That's established quite early in the book. Because in the book, get this, Lewis works for Max Cherry at the start. Like, Doing what? I don't know, just helping out around the office. At one point he goes to pick up some Mexican kid, and or Cuban kid, and take him back to the, the so... office. But then they... Um, Louis apparently fucks it up by being too violent. And then later he gets resentful at Max and breaks into his office. And No, he goes to a, sh- a shop, tries to rob it, doesn't have a gun, goes to Max's office, breaks in, steals a gun, goes back to the shop and then robs that. I don't like that. I know. I don't like them having pride. Having, because the, the whole thing is that they keep running into this random dude. Yeah. That they only met like a week ago. It doesn't really work at the end when he's like, yeah, you know who I saw there, Max Cherry. Does he still show in the book? I think so. He still dies in the same way. I love the lines he comes out with her. It's so, like, the way he says things. It's just, like, there's this point where I think it's Melanie asks him how long he's been out of jail, and he goes, he holds up four fingers, and, like, four, four days. <laughs> it's like, holds up four fingers. It's very strange. He's so nervous. Because he just got out of jail. Apparently, he... Four, had, four days ago. He wanted the Max Cherry role originally to Nero, and didn't, didn't get it, and didn't get all with Quentin afterwards about it. No. They, they kept, I don't want him, my, he's not my Max Cherry. I know Cherry. he's not Max Cherry. Robert Force is Max he's Cherry. He's not sweet enough. <laughs> He does have that weird kind of gormlessness. <laughs> yeah. Robert Forster could have been Lewis. Look at that. That's even worse. I know. You probably would give him Beaumont. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff with Max and his wife in the book as well. He's got a wife? Yeah, who he's getting divorced from. Ah. She's, uh, she spends all her time at an art gallery with a Cuban busboy. Too much nothing in this book. I know, yeah. Really? I don't know, it like took all the good things and made all the bad things good. Also, it opens at a clan rally uh, where... <laughs> or, <laughs> what? Or Deli's pointing out to some guy who they're going to uh, kill, a, a neo-Nazi, whose house he's going to go to and they're going to take his guns. Or Del's such a weird character. He is, isn't he? I, one thing I picked up on this watch through was that he has so much free time to just follow people. <laughs> <laughs> he's always following people. That's kind of the dream, isn't it? Because he gets a lot of... Sorry, <laughs> your dream is to have enough free times that you can just follow people. No. And then either murder or try to murder them. No. He tries to murder a lot more people in the book. Really? Yeah. All his boys. He's... What are his boys? Are these named boys? Yeah, I forget what they are. Unnamed boy too? He's Jack boys, I think they are. 
Jack boys. Yeah, like they t- steal things and stuff. That's the Travis Scott thing. Yeah. One of the things I remember about this is that the Michael Keaton character is also in the Soderbergh film Out of Sight. Yeah. He's the same character. He's that Elmo Leonard character. I've seen Out of Sight. I don't remember much about it, but I remember being like, ah, it's him. That's really Nicolette. One other thing I had about Ordell is he seems to be very cunning and calculated, like in his murders. But then he gets constantly outsmarted by Jackie. <laughs> he's a bit too, like, headstrong almost, like. Yeah. And it comes back to bite him. I think he's just overconfident. Yeah. I mean. Like, he assumes that all the people who he's dealing with are idiots, because, like. I mean, he's having to kill Bobot. That's not hard, is it? No, and it's bad when Melanie's, like, smarter than you and has got you figured out and everything. Yeah. It's a big thing in the book that he's an idiot, and <laughs> Melanie's constantly outsmarting him. Do you think it was his own wardrobe? Sam Jackson. I could see Sam Jackson just wearing all the stuff that Ardell wears. Could be. I know that doesn't he like to have like the wigs and keep all the hair stuff that he gets to wear? Does or he? keep his costumes? What a freak. <laughs> I know that he collects uh, action figurines of himself. There's no way there's Jackie Byrne action figures. There definitely is. Can I set up my own Max Cherry? play scene with Lewis? <laughs> Recreate the Lewis Bellamy scene but actually he does just hit her. <laughs> Hold up four fingers. <laughs> Maybe you can get a, um, an Ordell action figure where you like pull a string at his back and it actually says Max Cherry. So, <laughs> the whole Max Cherry... For years before we watched this film together, Mark would quote this scene. It's towards the end of the film where Lewis is explaining that he saw Max Cherry in the department store. Uh, to which Ordell's response, you thought, was... Max Cherry! He doesn't actually say that. No. She says, Max Cherry! And then to something else. I, and then makes a very good face. <laughs> I like my good faces. But now this, that's the climax of the movie to me. <laughs> just, nothing after that really matters. The whole, like, going to the office thing. I don't whatever. really remember that much of the end of that Well, It's a very confusing plot, isn't it? Not it really. the place. I find it a bit confusing. It's, it's interesting in that it, it's not one of these films where it's like, ooh, whose side is Jackie on? Is she, play, is she playing Ardell? Is she playing the cops? Like, whose side is she on? But really, it's just like, ah, oh, no, I'm going to work with this guy and... Screws them both over. Yeah, well, they call it, it makes that quite clear. And it's like, ah, it just Ugh. instead of messing about trying to be like, ooh, who said she on? It's like she's just being cool. Yeah, the particularities of the plot are really important. It's all about her and Max. It's a romance. It's a hangout movie. He's just cool. A lot of cool going on here. It's just good characters hanging out, like real Bravo. In the book, of course, because uh, we don't see Jackie and Max have sex or anything in the film. Yeah, no. in the book, they do. It's really yeah. explicit. At what point? I don't know. I think he just comes over to her place and then that's it. That's just a random chapter? Yeah. Oh. And I think they confess that they're in love for it with each other. Max is quite ahead of the curve on, like, big asses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Did you enjoy the soundtrack? Yeah. It's like a uh, soul. But then you've got the Foxy Brown song in there, Letter to the Firm. Reference to Foxy Brown the film. Yes. Uh, also, Gria was Foxy Brown. I'll get Foxy Brown the rapper. To do... I didn't, didn't listen to the firm album. You told me to listen to that firm album. I did. Because it, this it's weird that the firm existed for a short time, but the firm's been immortalised in Jackie Brown. <laughs> it's no Illmatic, is it? The firm album? Yeah. Oh, it's better than Illmatic. It's AZ, Dr. Dre, the other one, Foxy Brown and Nas. Make it good. I'm doing a bit. Oh, okay. It's not... It's, it's, I, know. I know. I would hope you were doing Firm a bit. album was a famous failure. Yeah. Like, uh, like, you, like Dr. Dre mentions on the song, I uh, forgot about Dre featuring Eminem. I've heard it. Don't like Eminem. A lot of people describe this film as being a blaxploitation homage. It's not really, is it? No. Other than the fact Pam Grey is in it, and it's got a cross 110th Street in it. If anything, it's more of an Elmore Leonard homage. It's, if it's, it's reading into Tarantino's kind of... Head, because you'd expect you know it's the kind of thing you'd expect from him. Yeah. So people were like, it is that because I want it to be that. That's the interesting thing about this. And Tarantino doesn't like, I think, when people call this his best film. Oh, but it is. It is. I, I know it. Is. <laughs> I guess because he didn't write the source material. Well, he probably should have written a different movie then. If he's like, oh, I'm, uh, he's going to complain about people being like, oh, I don't, I don't see you like it because I didn't write it. Why don't you make a movie? I hope. Idiot. <laughs> it's it's not the Tarantino pure vision, but it's interesting how, like I said earlier, it's less violent than the book. And also, like, in some ways, the Tarantino... The stuff that Tarantino adds into it feels more like Elmore Leonard, and the Elmore Leonard original stuff feels more Tarantino-ian. 
So it's kind of weird fusion there. It's like the yin yang kind of thing. Yeah, like I think the the novel brings out the best of Tarantino in terms of him him just like he's not doing all these irritating like bits that he I does. Just look at a lot of tall like trademark Tarantino, but it's not car over... trunk shot. Yeah, the feats is. Yeah, the feats is. Um... But I think because the characters are already formed, they don't do the thing where they all sound like him. Speaking of sounding like him, do we want to go off on Tarantino? Because I want. doubt we're ever going to do another Tarantino film. I'm sure you'll get the tape of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, I'm sure I will. Uh, he's obviously this huge known director, but we like him for some of the lesser known absurd shit he said. Like he was just a bit weird? Like the Rick Ross interview. <laughs> <laughs> do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, no, carry on with the Rick Ross bit. So Mark showed me this video, probably like th- oh, three, four years ago. Yeah. He would quote this Tarantino line, um, and I had no idea where it's from. I didn't even know who Rick Ross was at the time. Who, what, what? Who, right, Wick Ross? <laughs> what the Wick Ross? <laughs> Jonathan Ross? Ricky Ross from Deacon Blue, is yeah. it him? <laughs> but you show me this uh, <laughs> this interview. It's a it's an edited interview, it's really yeah. not funny, the way it's edited. But the things he says in it is just bizarre. It's like a press video for... Django. Django Unchained and uh, it's Rick Ross talking about hanging out with Rick Ross <laughs> what did I just say? you said it's a Rick Ross talking about hanging yeah, out yeah no with I did right <laughs> keep that in it's a, it's a Tarantino oh, I, I'm losing my train of thought it's Tarantino talking about how he's hanging out with Rick Ross no he wasn't hanging out with Rick Ross he was just at some place and who should walk in but oh. Rick Ross you tell the story then and Rick Ross and, and the, the whole pussy <laughs> It's so embarrassing. It's one of the most shocking things I've seen a human say. <laughs> it's so out of line. <laughs> Bizarre. Uh, he's done worse. I mean, have you, have you seen the video? Yeah, but... He presented that award. Not funny worse. No. Get out of here, you fucking bitch. <laughs> That's a recent one. Yeah, that was him on Joe Rogan, I think. The, the, the Tarantino memes have become more subtle. Like, now it's just the one of him walking around the house. Is it a house or a museum? It's a museum. Yeah, that's hard to... Yeah, it's good. Um, People don't like Quentin. No, because he built reputation, reputation up. Yeah. He's a controversial figure. I feel bad for him now. The foot things got out of hand. I saw a, a <laughs> the, video... The foot of, things got out of foot? I saw a video where uh, a girl asked him to sign her feet. And I just found that very awkward and embarrassing. Like, she was trying to make fun of him. So I just kind of like some Tarantino to see if he won for each no, toe. Not in but now. Nah. No. You know, he got like knuckle tattoos. <laughs> Tarantino across the Tootsies. I'd feel bad. I don't like people may, uh, bullying him for his foot fetish. He does put it out there. He does put it out there. He has been defending it recently. Good. Uh, defending the feet? Yeah, he just never ex- made it explicit before. It's always just been a thing in his foot films. fetishes have been way more normalised. You see, again, much like Max was ahead of the curve on big asses, I'm he's not... ahead of the curve on sucking toes. Louis Bunuel likes sucking toes. He's always got feet in his films. He's always got eyes in his films. Yeah. Eyes and feet. This is, uh, I think Max Cherry is my favourite Tarantino character, even though he's not a Tarantino character originally. You think? Yeah. Why? Because he's so... It's very much a Robert Forrester character. Yeah, he's just so... There's something so poetic about him as a character. I feel like De Niro was trying to do more characters like this in the 90s, though. He was trying to do more Max Cherry type roles. And it it wasn't working. You need to go off the path and do something stupid like Lewis. (laughs) It's interesting, because... I feel like Ter- uh, De Niro has a reputation of always playing these cool these cool Italian gangsters. But if you look at all of his best films, it's always him playing a loser. But I mean, like, but he was going against that. Yeah. He, idea. I mean, like, you think of like a Bronx tale and stuff like that, where he's just some schlubby dude. Yeah. I really don't feel like we've, we've hardly touched on the film, but it's so weird. I know, we always do this. This is the same with our Jerry Lewis thing, where we're like, oh, it'd be so good to finally talk about Jerry Lewis, and then yeah. we just didn't. We just ended up talking around the film. Yeah. What is it that you like about this film? It's very 90s y. Yes. But in a way that isn't, I don't want to say typical, because I mean, like, people think, oh, the 90s, it was pop fiction, blah, 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 blah. This wasn't that. This was more reserved, mm. but it still has the style. Yeah. And uh, yes, it wasn't as, like, trend setting and as, like, culture shifting as a pop fiction. It does it in your face as pop fiction. No, it sits in a very nice place. Yeah. Um, Again, as I said, it's some of the best characters. I mean, like, everyone's a good character in this. It's what I said. It's what... Every single 
character is memorable. Um, Melanie Lewis Simone Del- Simone that's what I was trying to think of Sharonda Ray the other one Beaumont who's the other cop? oh moustache guy yeah oh, creepy yeah it's just it's a every scene is light because there's so much good interactions and it's looks so pleasant I think it was Tarantino who coined the term hangout movie you keep you keep referencing this you always bring up the term hangout movie in the podcast I like hangout movies like Rio Bravo I think that's what he cited as well. That's a very good hangout movie. And that's two and a half hours as well. It's flies by. Is this a hangout podcast? Yeah. Do you want to make people think they're here with us? It, sat on the floor with us? The kind of film where it's not like... There's plot happening, but it's not really important. You're just hanging out with these characters and it's really chill. And good vibes. That's what I want. I don't like plot. <laughs> Who does? It's dull. Anytime someone asks me what a film is about, I don't know what to say. I don't care. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's just... I, it's one of these films where I've seen it so many times now. It's like one of these, it's like barred itself into me. And I'm like, yeah. it's always it's always good times. Oh, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to pick it for the podcast because it's an easy. As much as we said, we haven't really talked about the film. We've talked around it. It's an easy one to talk about. As much as you said, you don't remember the end of the film. One of my favorite parts is at the end when. Oh no, I'm not saying that. I'm just yeah, saying no, yeah, the yeah. climax of my mind is now the, the scene that we've misquoted for so long. But I do love the the scene at the end when uh, Jackie asks Max to come away with him with her. And he says no. And then he has that kind of look on his face where he feels quite resigned. And he's old now. He's going to retire soon. And then he's going to go to the, the movies and... Uh, Watch something that starts soon and looks good. Yeah. Print line. It is. And then it pulls up with that big crane shot. Oh. And you feel, oh, it's Max Cherry. He's doing all right. They're due a sequel for this. <sighs> Max's son. Uh, maybe they'll get... Uh... <laughs> Uh, who's the guy who played Harry Truman in the original Twin Peaks? Oh, <laughs> right. uh, uh, Michael something. Michael Odkin. Yeah. <laughs> Pam Greer had a renaissance after this film. She so did. Was she still really in Escape from LA? Yeah, she was dancing about. And she was in Ghosts of Mars. Ghosts of Mars, your, your favourite film. Bones, of course. Oh, your Bones! I, like, I do like Bones. Is that both O one? Yeah. She had a good O one. <laughs> Ghosts of Mars and Bones. That's like... We've each got like a weird, hotter, deep cut pick there. Yeah. Your one has Snoop Dogg, mine has Ice Cube. One's in Mars, one's in uh, Los Angeles. Or something. I think it's in LA. Both are very visually pleasing. Yeah. Why are we talking about Ghosts of Mars and Bones in this podcast? I love Ghosts of Mars. When was the last time you watched Ghosts of Mars? Ooh, exactly a year ago. Really? Yeah, I watched it in October oh. of uh, 2020. Yeah, I mean. She's still kicking about doing stuff. She'll still pop up, mm. surely. I think she's been doing a fair bit of TV. Yeah. So it's like, oh, that's Pam Greer. Cool. I don't think she's had, uh, I mean, I don't think she's been given the chance to, but I don't think she's had such a, 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 like a memorable role since this. When um, Quentin... Uh, in, like, in terms of like starring. When she went to the interview and was in Quentin's office, she saw that he had a poster of like coffee or Foxy Brown or something on the wall. Simp. Yeah, well, that's what she thought. But he was like, oh, no, I just I just have that. It's not because you're here. It's kind of he awkward. He would say that, wouldn't he? He would. The weeb. <laughs> Weenie. And on that note, <laughs> shall we move on to film Due? Due. Sure. What is it? It's, a, it's your pick. Fahrenheit 451. Don't you mean cat sank up? Is that, are you speaking French now? Yeah. Wow. But I don't know how to say 451. You'd yeah. say like cat soul uh, sank, sank in the, uh, I don't know. Anyway, this is my first Truffaut film. I'm, I'm imagining it's not like a lot of his other films. No. It seemed very standard. You've seen the end of uh, 400 Blows. I've seen, it, <laughs> seen the end of 400 Blows like 400 times. <laughs> no, it's not like a lot of his films. Any reason you picked it? Well, I'll tell you what it is. I was like, we haven't done that many foreign language films on the podcast. There's probably some like mid-century auteurs who've got a lot of films on tape. Truffaut, I'll go with one of his. This is the only English language film he ever made. (laughs) Excellent. Did you have any interest other than that? Other than that? No, uh, kind of. Maybe just, I just, because I'm not that into Truffaut, as you know. Maybe I wanted to give him another chance. And you thought this film was... Okay. Yeah, me too. Didn't really blow my socks off. 
that's the true folk thing, isn't it? He's just okay. He's a socks on kind of guy. It's ironic that he spent most of his early career criticising all this middle bro, very standard quality cinema, and that that's just kind of what he is now. Yeah, I mean, I'd still like to go bottom. It hasn't put me off the idea of going back and watching some of his older French New Wave stuff. Yeah, you probably should watch Fortune of Blows. The full film, not just the last. Yeah, and maybe you should watch the other Antoine Douanella films. I mean, I've, I'm not go, I'm going out of my way not to. It's just not a high priority. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. Um, should we talk about the tape? No trailers. No trailers. Uh, um, wrong aspect ratio. I was going to say the cropping. Oh, the one for me just looked full screen. I know it's supposed to be 1.66. I had it. A... 1.66, fantastic it... aspect ratio. The standard for <laughs> European fair in the 70s. I had, I just had bar, like two black bars on the side of my screen. Uh, um, which is kind of funny because we were talking about um, cropping in relation to streaming services recently. Mm. And the whole Simpsons thing. The kind of jokes. And... Um, it was what we were watching Seinfeld in the flat. That on Netflix has been cropped to it's to lose its original aspect ratio. What's the deal with aspect ratios? Good one. Like, um, but there are some scenes in this where I'm watching it. and I'm like, there was one when um, they first talked together on the train, the weird mono rail thing. Yeah. Um, Upside down train. Yeah. Quite like that. And they're they're walking home and like they're on the edge of the frame and they just weren't on the screen. <laughs> There's just grass in the middle of the screen and nothing... There's no characters on screen. It's just art cinema. <laughs> what kind of shot? Um, so that was quite uh, noticeable. The most irritating thing for me was the fact that this film is notoriously very bright and very nice cinematography. Yeah, yeah shot by Nicholas Rogue, who would later yeah. go and direct Don't Look Now. Uh, and it was just incredibly grey and washed out. Yeah. The it, skin tones made them look great. So this is... I think I looked at... Uh, I think this tape is from 2000. Um, it's later than I expected. Yeah, but it looked very worn, even for being in 2000. So if you ever watched it, watched it to death, or just, I mean, maybe it was like, ah, uh, bang a Truffaut film on yeah. tape, get it out there. I mean, probably not even a Truffaut film. I, I doubt that most people who've seen this know it's Truffaut film, because it's so unlike his stuff. It's, to me, very British. It does have that British sci-fi quality, doesn't it? A lot, yeah, all the accents, and it's just like that Julie old... Christie. I, I have to say, though, 60s future is one of my favourite futures. It's interesting, though, because I know that Truffaut uh, really wanted to avoid the outlandish, quasi-futuristic costumes that he got around that time. He didn't want this to look like Tenth Victim or yeah. Danger Diabolic or anything like that. But it still had like the hallmarks of like 60s futurism stuff, with, yeah. like, the transport-wise and infrastructure-wise. Because a lot of the stuff is oh, it's like almost a rural setting. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like it's pretty accurate in that that's... I do like how it's like only slightly more futuristic. Yeah, I think, as I'm saying, that's probably what we're realistically moving towards. Like, it's uh, in rural areas especially. It's like, there's little implementations, but like, it's not to an overhaul of like housing changes. Yeah. Like, that's just not how it works. We've still got buildings. Most, I mean, this building right now is built in the, probably the 19th century. Most of the stuff in the buildings, like the massive TVs. Yeah. I liked it quite a bit at the start, but it kind of just is very meandering, isn't it? It is, it is. It's... It's kind of... I, I agree with the message, but it's a bit preachy. Yeah. Also, it's just kind of funny. That, I mean, the day and age we're in now, the books would be the bad thing. It's funny, because I didn't think you would like this film, because you don't read books. I can't read. Exactly. <laughs> but, so I mean, you don't really relate to it, do you? The message is still there. Um, the mess, I mean, the message I took from it is the whole idea of, like, sensitivity to art. Yeah, censorship. And, like, if I don't like it, then it shouldn't exist kind of mentality. It's also about how TV is bad. That's what Ray Bradbury said as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the, the ridiculousness. Yeah. Like, oh, why should we not books? Kind of thing. He's quite bad at the, the scene when he's, like, uh, confronting his wife and her friends. Oh, zombies! No, so zombies! <laughs> You're all zombies! That's what, that's what I'm seeing. It's like the whole idea of, like, if I don't like it, it shouldn't exist, which is it's terrible. I, it really terrifies me, that whole um, fear of art kind of thing. Yeah. Fear of music. Talking Heads. Good album. The best album. <laughs> Which I think still rings true, but yeah, it's quite heavy-handed. I mean... <sighs> I do like... To... I, my favourite character is the captain, the <laughs> Sir Cusack character, who does, does, does a lot of these long speeches about how philosophy is a waste of time, literature... Uh... He's kind of fun, because he always seems like he's one step ahead, but he's like, one step ahead in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the ending is a bit ridiculous. Oh, yeah, where they've all been... My, last, my last note just says fucking LMAO, what reminds me of becoming a book. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty grim, isn't it? Like, it doesn't, 
doesn't feel like they're really appreciating the books. No, it's just like a rope memory. memory yeah. yeah, it's like it's like the whole revising for a test thing. It's like, uh, do you know this knowledge, or are you just like learning it to regurgitate it? Bizarre. I mean, it's it's um, almost like it's very satirical at the end, though. It is quite tongue in cheek. Yes, it's what's the word I'm looking for? Obsessive to yeah. to a fault. Kind of you, you you dedicate your life to this, but now it's just kind of turned to nothing because you're not actually invested in it. Yeah, which is also quite depressing. I find it feels like how a lot of the physical media and stuff has become the realm of collectors and obsessives. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we are the people doing a podcast oh. on physical media. <laughs> but I know what you mean. It's um the idea of possession over something because that's that's I mean, that's what they're trying to stop. They're yeah. Trying to stop the whole uh, hoarding of the not even, not even hoarding, just having. I really re- way off. I did really relate to the that woman character towards the end who they burn alive. No, she burns herself oh, alive. Oh, the one with the box. secret library. Yeah. You is that how you want to go out a blaze amongst your books? Maybe, I could do that. I do have to say I do enjoy. I, I don't know if this is just like a weird nostalgia for a time I didn't exist in, but I, I really appreciate older book covers. Mm. Could put a lot of stuff we've got now. It's just more pleasant. Like it's all these books you read because a lot of the ones that you focus on here are like the classics. Oh, it's all too much graphic design in newer books. Like minimalism. Minimalism, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I just really like the old kind of... It's a lot of like early 20th century, like weird kind of novel. Like like a f- first couple editions kind of thing. I really like it. Yeah, me too. Makes me even sad when they burn the books. <laughs> did you like how Julie Christie played two characters? I did. It reminded me of like a Cheryl Lee in Twin Peaks kind of thing. Uh, like, yeah. Did just the different hair to differentiate them. I There's th- also something else that does that. That I'm, that I'm thinking of. I think it's also a sci-fi film. Can't pull it from memory right now. But ah, um, well. Apparently the other girl was originally going to be Jean Fonda, and then it was going to be Jean Seaberg or Tippi Hedren, but they couldn't get any of those, so uh, just Julie Christie doing it. Yeah, they were reading quite high with those. <laughs> Did you like how, when it opened, there was all those different colourful oh, shots? Zooms. And, and they announced the cast and crew with a voiceover? I did. It was like um, like having different like colour f- like, um, filters. Yeah, do you know when like you're like in a silent film? Yes, but I was gonna I was gonna <coughs> make a less relevant reference. You know, like when you're doing like arts and crafts and you get that thin kind of like it's, it's something kind of paper. Yeah. Do you like, know what I'm on about? Yeah. Yeah, it's like when you look up when you look through that, it's like ooh, it's a purple now. A quality street wrapper. That's the exact type of yes. Okay, that's the exact material I'm thinking of, like a quality street wrapper. What a reference. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. We've all looked through a quality street. <laughs> I think that uh, Truffaut really wanted to lead into promoting the book and letting the text do the talking. What he should have done is, uh, for the movie, made it about movies. Shouldn't be no movies. How ironic that Mr. Cinephile Francois Truffaut <laughs> won't make book film, no make film film. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Luc wouldn't have done that, would he? No. He would have made it. He would have made fuck. He would have had uh, plugs in his head. Thanks, Professor Pluggy. Do you like the score? By Bernard Herman. I do. I, I'm a big Bernard Herman guy. Me too. Well, of course, Trout Truffaut, good Hitchcock friend. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you speaking like you're brain dead? <laughs> I know. I am. I was reading a lot of Francois Truffaut's letters, and uh, he wrote to Hitchcock saying that uh, we had a good long conversation about you, me and Bernard Herman, and I know that in him you have a true and genuine friend. Oh, that's true. quite sweet. But he didn't get along with Oscar Werner, who plays the main character in this. Yes. Because... He's a bit bad. Montag. Yeah, Montag. Like a Montag Morgan. <laughs> uh, he played Jules in Jules and Jim. Uh, but he said that uh, Oscar Werner had too many ideas. Oh, no. Nice. Because he's a stage actor. And Truffaut said that shooting in English was a mistake. In Jules and Jim, I knew French, but he didn't. In <laughs> Fahrenheit, I didn't know English, but he did. I prefer it the other way. <laughs> did you like him in this film? Uh, he seemed flat, a bit. He? he did. He seemed a bit. Uh, I, I, now that you're seeing as a stage actor, I can I see that he was a bit like hammy. Yeah. There's a line at one point he says in sentence. Oh, it's when he's calling about um, when his wife's like an overdose or something. Yeah. He's on the phone, and the way he said "my wife" made me think of Borat. I <laughs> know. <laughs> oh, my wife. <laughs> There's a lot of um, interesting post-production stuff in this. A lot of interesting transitions between scenes mm. and a lot of montage. Montage. Yeah. Montagey? 
Yeah, just a lot of like close up, especially like book burning scenes. As I said, like you get close up with all the books. A lot of like um, there's some good some good slow mo with the books where they just like pouring them all out. <laughs> I like that. And then the fire and, um, transitions. When they're like getting ready in the fire station, they're all going down the poles and whatever. A lot of that is montage. Mm. Very clear to me how much montage there was. Like it's, it, it's weird when a montage stands out. Yeah. It was like Rocky four levels of like excessive montage. I feel like it made the film feel more disjointed and meandering though. The montage made it feel more disjointed? Yeah, it felt less flowing. I can see that, yeah. In um, terms of the narrative. Because it's based on a book, it's very narrative-led. That sort of undermined it how did you feel about the weird like um, authoritative society it was interesting because it didn't feel that authoritative did it it no. felt like the, the, the author, whoever was in charge of that society just was sort of taking a step back we didn't really get to see that much in terms of the dissenters obviously other than at the end but yeah. it is all based around the book stuff but I mean you see the regular civilians are like very like it's Conversations like, oh, back in the day, firefighters used to put out fires, not yeah. set them. Stuff like that. It's like a kid, or someone says, like the kid says that line, I think. Someone talks about, oh, law enforcement can be fun. It's like a lot of, um, <laughs> just, just lines that, yeah, the ideas are good, but the lines just make it seem like, oh, it makes you want to roll your eyes. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It's no demolition, man, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's no demolition, man. I really should read the book. It's a bit late now. Yeah, it is a bit late now. Uh, do you have that much else to say about it? Not a lot, no. Well, let's talk about Francois Truffaut then. I don't like Truffaut very much. It's funny, really dull. But uh, I used to like him more than Godard because he's more likeable than Godard because he's had a difficult life, whereas Godard's a privileged twat. Because they're still alive. I know. Well, well Truffaut got cancelled. Yeah, <laughs> cancelled when he was 53. Yeah. Do you, know about, do you know about the famous falling out they had in the early 70s? Yes. Yeah, so I was reading some of the letters and there's some fun, <laughs> some fun back and forth here. Godard was complaining that Truffaut could get funding for uh, La Nuit Americaine de for Night, mm-hmm. which he thought was a fraudulent film. And uh, he said, considering La Nuit Americaine, you ought to help me, because he wanted funding for his own films, so that the public doesn't get the idea that we all make films like you. <laughs> he was also annoyed that apparently uh, Truffaut doesn't show himself the director character in the film having sex with Jacqueline Bizet, which he was doing in real life. Ah, uh, what a sly fox. <laughs> but uh, Truffaut wrote a 20-page letter responding to this. Jean-Luc, so you won't be obliged to read this unpleasant letter right to the end. I'm starting <laughs> with the essential point. I will not co-produce your film. Secondly... This is the, this is the written form of yelling. Like, <laughs> it, it, you don't want to have a conversation, you just want to yell at points. I mean, he does accuse Godard of, like, his whole shtick is he just is a cut about things. And he just, like, will do a press conference where he'll walk in, say one a, a provocative thing, and then leave. But he says, Secondly, I'm sending back to you the letter you wrote to Jean-Pierre Léo. I read it and I think it's obnoxious. And because of that letter, I feel the time has come to tell you at length that in my opinion you've been acting like a shit. As regards That's a peep show line. <laughs> he really is a shit. As regards Jean-Pierre, who's been so badly treated since the business with Marie and more recently in his work, I think it's obnoxious of you to kick him when he's down. Obnoxious to extort money by intimidation from someone 15 years younger than you are and who you used to pay less than a million when he was the lead in films that were earning you 30 times as much. He then goes on about how Jean-Pierre Leo's gotten better as an actor, but he's really annoyed that... I never expressed the slightest reservation about you to Jean-Pierre, who admired you so much, but I know that you are bad-mouthing me behind my back in the way that a ki- guy might say to a kid, and your father, is he still pissed out of his mind? God, the fucking the bitchiness of these two. So good. Or of him. Which one, Truffaut or Godard? Truffaut, I mean, Godard just seems out of his nut just doing his own thing. Yeah, he was, it was his mowest period. I mean, he does say... Truffaut says you've changed your way of life your way of thinking yet even so you continue to waste hour after hour ruining your eyesight to the cinema why? <laughs> in the hope of finding something that will fuel your contempt for the rest of us that will reinforce all your newfound prejudices I can't lie I quite relate to his description of guitar I'd like to go to the cinema and find things to hate you do I mean that's what this podcast exactly. partially is it's just you talking about stuff you don't like that's why guitar's better than Truffaut. Yeah. Would you rather watch this or fucking Every Man for Himself? If First can, name Carmen. If you can get those on tape, I'll watch them again. I can get Every Man for Himself on tape. Get it for Have us. you seen that one? No. No, you've seen First Name Carmen. Uh, Brunon Garmin? 
friend will come in. Yeah. I like the bit where they... Listen, there's, there's uh, going to be a time and a place where we can talk about 80s guitar, and I can't wait for it. Do you have any more rantings about Truffaut, or is it all out of the system? No, it is. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad. I just, I just wanted to talk about those letters because I find them quite funny. Because well, I, I bought the Truffaut letter book. And you wanted to get your money's worth? Yeah. Oh. It was only one day, no. <laughs> Do you have anything more to say about Fahrenheit 451? No, I want to talk about the NFL. Yeah, I don't, but okay. So, the third tape we have is... Well, it's titled... American Football, an original NFL films video. Big plays, best shots, and belly laughs. What this is, is just a recap and highlights of the 1989 NFL season. And not a lot more. There's a guy talking about it a bit. There is. There's a guy in the studio. We only see him, like, three times. But, um... Slick. Slick it, man. It kind of tells the story of the NFL season of that year. I should start by saying, Mark does not care at all for the NFL. Don't understand it. But I'm a big fan, um, and when we lived together, you ended up watching some of it just by being in the same room. I'd give you my abusing commentary. Yeah, like... Garden of Minchu, he sounds like a Dark Souls boss. That, that was one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a 49ers fan, so it was quite enjoyable watching this um, recap of the season and not ending in heartbreak. Does Cam Newton play for the 49ers? Uh, no. <laughs> Cam Newton, I think, is an anti-vaxxer now. I know that. Um, I don't know why you bring up Cam Newton. I just thought about him. It's the one football player I know. Uh, Tom Brady. And Gardner Minshew. Yeah. All, all we need now is Gardner Minshew to have a stint on the Patriots. It was quite interesting to watch this because it's NFL Films, which is its own separate entity really from the NFL. It's their kind of like production wing. So if you notice when you're watching this, none of these were angles, like TV angles. Yeah. It was all on like... On the ground. Yeah, because like, they have their own camera crew or whatever they run stuff. And... You can still, they still operate today. It's produced in the exact same way almost. So it's the same kind of music, it's the same music library they play from, it's the same kind of angles they have. It's kind of interesting to see how much it hasn't changed. Yeah, what a mix of things up a bit, the lazy fucks. Well, what has changed is like, there's some absurd hits on this. Like people just getting helmet to helmet, like headbutt to the ground. It's quite dangerous to me. It is quite dangerous. That's why you can't do it now. Tell you what else has changed. I did notice this. The outfits look weird and fake in these older ones. Fake? Yeah, they look they they look like they should be on Takeshi's castle. Oh, is in the the clothes the players you're wearing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're, they're much more padded or whatever. Yeah. They look like fake Takeshi's castle joke outfits. Was there wasn't there an NFL game in or a men's football game in Takeshi's castle? I think there might have been. Is that you think of the big sumo suits? <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of those kind of things. There probably wasn't an NFL one, there was a baseball one. Oh, the ba- remember the hands one where you run on the cards? Oh yeah. 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 Good show. Why are we getting a Takeshi's Castle tape? Uh, only if Craig Charles is doing the commentary. Not um, was it Jonathan Ross now? Yeah, it was this good. Oh, nah, you want Craig Charles. You always want Craig Charles. We should have a Craig Charles episode where we do that in Robot Wars. And Red Dwarf. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I did Jonathan Ross playing Lister. Terrible. <laughs> the, another thing that um, is still the same is where they have they mic up players. So they'll usually like either mic up a coach or like a player or whatever mm. and um, they'll pick like one person a game and like they'll be the mic'd up person. And it's... Again, it's presented in the exact same way it is here, like, 30 years ago, which is kind of mad. The commentary on this is so melodramatic. Yeah, yeah, like, it's the biggest thing ever that you're, yeah. that you're like, playing in the conference game. I think you're using all this ridiculous language, like, oh, what's one of the things that was said? I can't remember. Yeah, they talk about, like, the road to the Super Bowl, whatever, biggest land grab since Louis- the Louisiana Bridge. Just <laughs> stupid things like this. Nonsense. Um, the bit I like was they also were... We proudly present the AFC Central Division Symphony. And then it cuts to a symphony orchestra inside a tent. Not a thing anymore, the AFC Central. What is it? Well, they reshuffled the whole league. Oh. So it would be the AFC... Most of the teams in there are now in the AFC North. With the Ravens, Sands, the um, Oilers. I still don't know what any of this uh, What's AFC? Uh, American Football Conference. So it's like the league... The bit of league... Bit of league. It is a bit of the league. You're right, it is a bit of the league. Is the like AFC the Scottish and the Premiership NFC. and the... Listen, listen, but why do they all play together in the big Super Bowls? <laughs> this was more one for me. <laughs> a bit selfish of me to buy this. Um, buying a good time. One of the ca- I said characters, one of the players gets referred to as the Nigerian Nightmare. Yeah. Did you like the haircuts? Yeah, there was a lot of haircuts. There was a lot of... What it, was that one guy? He had a haircut that looked like Rams horns or yes, something. Yes, so he was a fan of... He was a Rams fan. 
Oh. And he was being an insane fan and um, shaved his hair into, the side of his hair into ram's horns. It looked horrendous. It did. It's a bit amazed to make it though, like it looked like one of the hair was a spike going through his ear. But it did look, you, you got what he was going for. Yeah. Which is it's so bad. It's, you don't know, it's admirable, but still horrendous. People are insane. Rams fans are terrible. Where's that from? Los Angeles. It was, well, I, I don't, I, this is me just telling you about the NFL now. Los Angeles. They're back in LA now. Um, Where was it at this time? LA. Oh, okay. Because they moved to St. Louis. I don't understand how the teams can move. <laughs> I don't want on tapes podcast turned to me lecturing you about the NFL. I'm just gonna say this was good. It was interesting to see a period of the NFL I'm not super familiar with. Like they were talking about players. I'm like, unless you're like a big player like a Barry Sanders or a John Elway or whatever, I don't really know. I've heard of him. Who? John Elway. <laughs> don't to list off the American football things I know. Things uh, or people? It's just uh, things. Bill Belichick. Cam Steve Belichick. Belichick. Yeah, Steve Belichick. Uh, Cam Newton. Tom Brady. Tom Brady kissing his son. <laughs> um, uh, the Super Bowl. Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew. Uh, John Elway. Uh, Johnny Unitas. He has a haircut you can say you watch too. Uh, touchdown. <laughs> uh, who's the one who doesn't have a watch you can say you watch too? Doesn't have a haircut. Oh, you Joe Namath? Say. Joe Namath. He's got, he looks like a girl. <laughs> it's cross terrific, Johnny Unitas. Is my upper lip supposed to bleed this much? Well, I'm glad to see you know everything about the NFL. <laughs> I know some team names. Seattle Seahawks. That's who uh, Frazier's dad supports. New, you, you New did, Orleans you did Saints. watch this tape for 15 minutes. I'd hope you'd know some. New Orleans Saints, they were never mentioned. They were shown. Were they? Oh, I missed them. <laughs> uh, New York Giants. Uh, uh, Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. Keep like, going my kid Garrel and Poe. Keep going till you get one wrong. San Francisco 49ers. Glad you know that one. LA Rams, Chicago Bears, Cleveland Browns. Oh, he's in a roll. Uh, um, Tampa Bay Packers. No. No, Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Tampa Bay. Ah, oh, we, we, Pirates. No, is it? Buccaneers. Buccaneers. The, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he's so hot. Oh, the old Buccaneers logo. You yeah. know, hey, that's another NFL thing, you know. Knife his nose. Miami Dolphins, like in uh, Ace Ventura. Very, very offensive film. Very transphobic movie. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Marino's in that one. There you go, can Marino. we, uh, can we, uh, here's a video for um, Twitter. Uh, can we post a Dan Marino freakout video? Sure. <laughs> anyway, I don't know that. Dan Marino was in this tape as well. He got hit quite hard. I forgot to say New England Patriots. I know them. <laughs> of course. Anyway, should we talk about next episode? Yes. We're going to do a themed episode. <gasps> At this time of the month. What, what's the theme? It's Halloween. So expect this episode December sometime. <laughs> Ooh. We're going to try and... We're going to do a horror-themed episode regardless. Hoping it'll come out around Halloween. Hopefully. Um, hopefully. And I'm scared already. Oh, oh, because it's spooky season? Yeah. Oh. You've got, I'm looking up at your door that says keep out and there's ghostly things there's, on it. Oh, you do have some Halloween decorations up already. So, in fitting with that, what tape do you have? I'll get it. I am now. Okay, let me know what you've got. I'll show you. Driller Killer. Abel Ferraris, the Driller Killer. This Fuck. is early Ferrara, right? Yep. He's, well, his second film after Nine Lives of Wet Pussy. <laughs> I'm, I'm all here for this. So, Video Nasties, we can discuss Video Nasties. What's the sticker on? I have no idea. It says one seven eight. See, you asked me if this is a slasher. It's more of a driller. I'm excited for that. Um, I'm gonna show you now. Now what I've got. Right. So you've got <laughs> Final Destination two. I don't think I've seen that one. Have you seen Final Destination? Uh, that's the plane one. Yes. That's the, the third one. Is the roller coaster one? Yeah. What's the second one? It's like a driving one, I think. Oh. Have you also seen Final Destin Destinations 1 and 3, but not 2? Yeah. This is good. I'm, I'm the same. The third one has the, the sunbed. I remember the sunbed. third one is the first one I watched when I was younger. and was just like, oh, it's a scary movie. I'm watching my friends. And then the second one, the, sorry, the first one I watched fairly recently and quite enjoyed. It's just like a middle-of-the-road horror film. But yeah. I, think, I think we can get a lot out of it. Well, it's, uh... Just talking about the kills. Yeah, it's kind of in that classic, uh, like, just films about teenagers dying era, isn't it? 
Yeah, the Kevin Williamson kind of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. See, the issue is I've seen a lot of those. Like your Cherry Falls, your still, I Know You Did Last Summer. Still Know You Did Last Summer. Yeah, Valentine with uh, David Boreanaz. Oh. But yeah, I hadn't seen Final Destination 2, so I was like, Fair why enough. not? So. Urban Legend. Urban, great movie. Well, not, watch Urban Legend. not actually Final a great movie. Soon. I don't think I have any in here, but should we see how spooky the, the random tape is? Oh, I'm sure it'll be terrifying. Oh, I've got the hat, so... You're already... I don't know why... Yes, you're already holding the hat. I guess I'll just give it to myself, then. <laughs> Doing the Rod Stewart machine thing again. I Call back to that. I've already taken it out. Right, so it says... 17! Are you ready? Yep. Go in now. Uh, not traditionally spooky. Well, we'll see. I'll be the judge of that. It's... It's... <laughs> it's... No, I'm quite scared of Kenneth Ordman. <laughs> What's the it, tape? It's Carol Vorderman's video class <laughs> times tables. 50 minutes of uh, pop music, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a new way of learning the national curriculum, okay. Uh, a highly original and entertaining uh, style helps to turn learning into a pleasure. So it's Carol Vorderman teaching us the times tables. To music. Good. What is this outfit she's wearing out there? <laughs> Oh, uh, you, know, you can put that in the video. It's one of the weirder tapes I've found. Uh, I don't know what to make of it. She looks weird here. She looks she bad does look weird. She looks it's wrong there. Yeah. What year is it from? It doesn't say what year it's from on here. 1991. Oh. That would explain a lot. Yeah, so... Um, down, only been on like five years at that point. I hope you're looking forward to learning your times tables next week. I sure week. am. It's a new and exciting way to learn the National Curriculum. <laughs> And that sounds <laughs> Well, that's the dog. I hope uh I hope you're looking forward to our spooky episode yeah, next time. I sure am. Terrified. I'm terrified, terrified of it. Might not even happen. I'm so scared of it. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna ask you any closing remarks, Mark. Max Chen.